Hello, welcome to another episode of Peace and Mind. Today I want to try to convince you that suicide is not a very good idea. Why is it so? Well, first of all, I brought this topic because I'm very sad about Anthony Bourdain. I don't know if you know him, but he just recently committed suicide. And he was a great guy. I mean, many people loved him, other people didn't like him. But he had everything we could consider a success. He was wealthy, he had fame, he had followers, he had everything. And he was traveling around the world, visiting different countries, different communities, and his main topic was food. So he always had love for food. So in these episodes, he used to do, um, he would show a place and focus on the food of that region or that area and take you to these uh, restaurants or sometimes he will be eating with local families and showing the traditional dishes and he would be tasting all of them and giving his his comments which was he was very funny and well you could imagine a person like that that has much more than the average people yet we don't know the cause of his committing suicide but many people assume it was he was depressed or he could have maybe known he was, he had an illness or I don't know whatever it was the cause he was clearly thinking that that was a better solution to whatever problems he had than staying alive and facing them so why do people commit suicide that's something that always shock us because life is so precious many of us like we really try to take care of our bodies, of our minds, because we value being alive and what we can do with this life. But on one hand, it's also understandable that very smart people get depressed. Why? Because when you analyze the meaning of life, if all you believe about life is that you're just here to have pleasures, accumulate as much as you can, earn as much money as you can, get as much experiences, as much pleasures, and then you're just going to die and disappear, and that's it, over. You can imagine that someone who spends all their life looking for those pleasures, all these things, maybe if they don't find it, they feel depressed, they don't see meaning of life, they commit suicide, right? Because they have much more suffering than pleasure, and they... They weren't able to make money and have pleasures. And so they, at some point they say, oh, okay, all my life has been suffering, dissatisfaction, and then there's nothing else after that, so let's just cut it. On another hand, there might be some people who actually are able to get all those things, to get money, fame, success, pleasures, everything, power. Yet they realize at some point that these things are not true causes of happiness. Why? Because they are going to disappear, they're changing, they're worn out. They are temporary causes of happiness and pleasure. They give you some joy, but after a while they don't give you and then you crave something else. So they realize after a while that no matter how many pleasures and money and fame and success they have achieved, it's not enough. The satisfaction is still there. So what do they do? Well, they really analyze and say, well, striving for getting more of this is meaningless. I know it's not going to bring me more happiness because I already experienced it. On the other hand, if they believe that they are just going to die and disappear and that's it, it may seem more attractive because they say, well, there's no point to life. Mm, there's no lasting happiness. There's much more dissatisfaction than happiness. So let's finish it. Right, And that's what happens sometimes to depressed people. They are reflecting on how things are impermanent, how things are non-true causes of happiness, and they just don't see a point to this life. But that is because we don't know. We don't know anything else. And we think that, that there's nothing to live for. There's no way to make this life meaningful. So if you, if you get depressed in that way, it's very easy to start filling your mind with mental afflictions to the point that you're totally clouded by these afflictions and you're just reinforcing through your thoughts these feelings 
of depression and meaningless and indifference towards everything and just sinking, sinking, sinking to the point that you don't see with clarity. You cannot experience happiness anymore. You may pretend that everything is okay and tell everybody that you're okay and smile and do things, but deep down you feel empty. You feel lonely. Loneliness is also interesting because we sometimes think that happiness is in the relationship with others, to be loved, to be praised, and when someone betrays us or they act selfishly, they are unkind with us or they criticize us, that also can have a very strong impact because we are relying on those people to bring us happiness to be reliable sources of support, of encouragement, of kindness and generosity towards us. And then when they fail us and we put energy into them, it can be very disappointing and depressing. And if you feel you're not loved by anybody and that everybody hates you or they criticize you or they don't understand you, that they are only thinking about their own well-being, then you can also get so depressed to the point of wanting to live this life. But the thing is, what if you take out your life and then it gets worse? We never think about that. And it might be just a spe speculation, but it, ca it can't be. It has the same probabilities that you end up your life and there's nothing else than you end up your life and there's actually more experience. And those experience might not be so different or might be even worse than what you're experiencing right now. So if you listen to what some spiritual traditions tell us about life after death, many of them have a similar view or a similar account. Especially in some of them, they show us how our actions or our mental state previous to the moment of death can lead to more of the same because conditions arise in our lives due to previous causes and we know that when we are in a mental state it's very difficult to come out of it because we keep feeding it with thoughts and emotions. So many spiritual traditions say that if you die with a mental state that is depressed, negative, hateful, attached, the experience that follows after that is going to get very, very scary or very unpleasant. So I'm not going to go into detail. I invite you to read some of these accounts and make your own mind about it. But consider that nobody has proven scientifically that there's nothing after that. So these spiritual traditions also haven't proven to us, but they have some interesting stories. And I think we should be wise and consider both sides, both uh, propositions, and be careful. Okay, if, it, if you die and there's nothing, fine. Okay, you end it. You're not going to be there to know about it. But if you actually find yourself immersed in a new experience, it's like when you go to sleep every night. If you go to sleep and you you don't have dreams, fine. But sometimes you go to sleep with a certain mental state and then your dreams are really nightmares. So you don't have control over the experiences that are coming. Except when you are a person that really trains and prepares for that trip. So that's one fir first thing to consider is that taking life is not something that one should do just like easy, easily, right? Taking the life of other sentient beings is really a very negative action in the sense that you are taking from that being the most precious thing they have. And you might think there's no consequences. You might think it's the same to being Mother Teresa than being like Hitler and that there's no consequences to your actions. But that's a little bit illogical because every action has a consequence and we should be responsible of our actions because we are going to experience the consequences of those actions. So imagine if taking the life of another being is something 
very very heavy a very heavy action taking your own life is equally or worst it's a very heavy negative action because life is very very precious and with life you can achieve so much not in the sense of material wealth and power because we already saw those things don't bring you lasting happiness but with a human life you can achieve liberation from suffering complete liberation from dissatisfaction suffering and you can cultivate immeasurable compassion loving kindness towards other beings it's in our nature to be compassionate to be loving towards others but we've been hurt we don't know how we expect the others to love us in return but we can we can train our minds to be happy to be loving to be compassionate to be generous to bring something meaningful to the world to help society to help those who are suffering and want to live to help those who are hungry those who don't have shelter or medicines putting our lives in the service of humanity makes you happy it's a cause of happiness because you're not focusing on yourself which is self-centered attachment and that is a cause of suffering dissatisfaction depression and all the mental affliction so the moment you start focusing on the needs of others in that moment your focus changes your way of experiencing reality changes and you start experiencing a joy that doesn't come from food and sounds and experiences like traveling it comes from the joy of making other people happy liberating them from their suffering in any way you can you can give money you can give food you can give your time you can give service you can teach you can bring support in so many ways you can do so much for those around you in many ways there's many ways there's always a way even if you don't have time maybe you can give donation to organizations who are doing it you can help you can help making this world better you can put your little grain of sun that's one point living a life that is focused on helping and supporting others and making them feel that they are not alone because many people feel lonely like you and so making them feel that they count on you giving them support that's precious that's precious another thing that this life is very useful for and makes it very meaningful to be lived is to develop wisdom in the sense of understanding reality as it is and not as we project it to be reality what do we know about reality we know that it's impermanent and that's not a religious thing or a dogmatic thing we know everything everything is impermanent our bodies are impermanent and every sound is impermanent every sensation experience pleasure everything is impermanent people that come to our lives they go or they change or they die people are impermanent you are impermanent to your body your personal story your body your mind are changing there's not one part in yourself that is not changing so understanding impermanence is very important to develop wisdom a wisdom that liberates from suffering dissatisfaction and problems the causes of our suffering are ignorance this ignorance to project permanence to project uh, inherent existence to things that are constantly changing and interdependent and not really having a true independent identity and that means that we see things as existing by their own side things people everything we think of these things as being independent and unchanging but they are actually just changing all the time and the appearance we get of permanence or independence of these things are just illusions because they are actually interdependent with a lot of other conditions causes and conditions and their arising is like a rainbow when conditions come together these things appear to be there when the conditions are not there they they dissolve disintegrate change they transform into something else So this kind of understanding of reality is very, very important. Also understanding how we project positive qualities and negative qualities to everything that we encounter in our life. So, for example, sometimes we uh, see or find things that are pleasant. Pleasurable food, pleasurable sounds, pleasurable people, pleasurable experiences, and we create them. We go after them. 
our whole system of being productive and making money is because we are after the money because we really think if we only have a little bit more money or very much more money is going to solve our problems and it's going to bring bring us all the pleasures we think that if we have fame and we have uh, power we have love we have a bunch of pleasant things that appear to be pleasant then of course we're going to be happy but as we saw these things change they are unreliable there's no warranty you can get them and they are not really sources of pleasure and happiness so one object that might be pleasant for you for the person might not be pleasant why because it all depends on what are you projecting and how are you perceiving this particular object So you might hear of the new iPhone and feel craving and feel that that object is going to bring you happiness and then you engage in a lot of actions and activities to get the money to get that iPhone. But when you have it, yeah, it brings you some joy at the beginning. Then later you just get used. You think like it belongs to you. You ignore it or you... It's just not bringing you pleasure. It might be useful, but it's not very pleasant. But then if you lose it or it's stolen, then you start suffering because then you feel attachment and you feel like you really need it. So we oscillate between this craving and attachment to these things that we project their sources of happiness, they're positive, they're good. And on the other hand, we relate to things that we perceive as being negative or that they bring us suffering or pain with rejection, with aversion, with anger. And we also project permanence on these things and we want them to go faster than they would. We think they're going to be there forever bothering us and creating suffering for us. But actually they are also impermanent. So the point here is to develop wisdom and equanimity. Equanimity to understand that things come and go. They bring us pleasures. They bring us sadness. But the more we can remain in equanimity knowing how things exist, knowing that they are just appearing in that form due to our personal history, due to our projections, and letting them come and go. Then you start finding peace. And the peace of mind is already there in your mind, the qualities of peace, bliss, clarity, but we don't let them develop because we want to get this from things that are outside. We're pursuing things. But when, when we sit in meditation and we observe our mind and we let it settle in its natural state, we start experience a peace, non-conceptuality, silence that is so, so blissful. And then we experience clarity, a sharpness of the mind, vividness. And these are qualities that arise naturally when we settle and when we stop pursuing things and we just sit and observe things as they are. We sit and observe our breath. We sit and observe our mind and our thoughts without getting hooked by them and the emotions that arise related to them. So as we do this, we purify the mind, we, we calm the mind. The mental afflictions don't have power over us anymore and they, they subside. But in order to really cut these roots, the roots of these mental afflictions from the very, very root, the way to cut them is by developing sharp wisdom. Wisdom of understanding how they arise and noticing that they are also interdependent phenomena, that they are arising due to causes and conditions and they have no intrinsic reality. They are not something external happening to us. So only through meditation we can really calm our mind and start looking through all these emotions, thoughts, projections and really go deeper and deeper into the stillness of the mind and find that clarity, develop wisdom, develop compassion and bring that to the world. Bring that to the world in a way that we can be of benefit, we can support each other, we can bring joy to the lives of others and then our life will have meaning. And if it has meaning and we're doing these things not only for ourselves, our mental afflictions start subsiding and then we start helping others to get free also of their mental afflictions, their dissatisfaction, their depression. 
And then we start really experiencing joy, the joy of knowing reality, the joy of developing wisdom, the joy of compassion, the joy of helping and caring for others, and the joy of finding peace and stillness of the mind, of stop needing things to make us happy because happiness is already found within our minds and we don't need to get it from somebody or from something external. So these are a few things to consider and I just want to encourage you to keep analyzing, to keep finding within yourself more reasons to be alive and to share all your potential with others, to keep developing, to keep transforming yourself, improving yourself, to be a better person, be more generous, be more kind, more patient, but very importantly, more wise. Stop pursuing things that are not going to bring you happiness. Stop cultivating mental afflictions that only will lead you to depression and help, help those people who are feeling that life has no meaning and has no, there's no point to live for. Be a source of encouragement and support for them because it's very sad that we let other human beings get into those depressive states and kill themselves. And sometimes when it's someone close to us, we feel regret because we feel maybe we could have given more attention to that person that was showing signs of depression or loneliness. We could have done something, but yet we are just so focus on ourselves and our needs and our money, our job, our things, those things we think will bring us happiness that we don't see those around us that are suffering, that are lonely. And we can make a difference by supporting them and really try to avoid having more people committing suicide. Thank you very much. See you soon. Please consider supporting this podcast at patreon.com forward slash Alba Ayon. Thanks for listening to Peace and Mind with Alma Ayon.